comes to console launches, few companies have made as significant an impact across the industry as Nintendo. And with all the NX news this week, I thought it was the perfect time to look back at the shining stars of past Nintendo launches. Hey guys, welcome to DF Retro's Nintendo launch celebration. Today, we're gonna take a look back at the big launch titles that define Nintendo's various consoles over the years, from stuff like Super Mario 64 for the Nintendo 64, through the original 8-bit Super Mario Brothers. All of these games made a huge difference when they launched with Nintendo systems. So even though many of the consoles did not launch with a lot of games, they were launched with some really important ones. And that's what I wanna take a look back at today. Which ones hold up still today? And what kind of a difference did they make when they first launched? That's exactly what we're going to explore. So hang on tight and let's get started. And it all starts here with Super Mario Brothers. The NES was not exactly a technical powerhouse, but by combining hardware-based scrolling, dedicated video memory, and ample sprite display capabilities, Nintendo was able to create something truly revolutionary here. Of course, Super Mario Bros. was not the first platformer by any means. Nintendo itself had actually created Donkey Kong and Mario Bros. before this, for instance, both of which focused on platformer-style gameplay. It wasn't even the first game with multi-screen scrolling, either. But it was one of the first to combine these elements into a neatly packed 40 kilobyte ROM with such a huge amount of content. The game featured a large assortment of levels, but those levels were created from meta tiles, a technique in which smaller tiles are used to compose larger objects. Every character and bit of scenery in the world is composed of these elements, and that is a key to its creation. These small tiles can be used and reused across the game in order to build something much more complex than originally thought possible, while saving greatly on space. Many NES games would also go on to include additional chips designed to improve functionality of the system, but Super Mario Bros. is running on a stock system without any additional hardware. It's also a masterstroke of game design, something you can appreciate from the very first moment. After all, this type of game was still new at the time, and without any text at all, the game manages to teach the player exactly what is possible. If you die right here, for instance, by simply moving forward, you'll learn that you can press buttons to actually jump. But if you jump at this time, you might actually end up hitting a block, revealing the fact that there are goodies inside. This kind of thing continues throughout the first level. But essentially, the level layout is designed to ease players into the game by organically showing them what's possible through natural experimentation. We could go on for hours about Super Mario Bros., but this is really just the beginning of Nintendo's innovation period that would last for decades. The NES would go on to host a huge number of visually impressive titles from both third parties and Nintendo itself. By using more advanced mappers, some of the later NES games produced results you wouldn't have expected in 1985. But as the 80s drew to a close, 16-bit became the new buzzword, and it wouldn't be long before Nintendo had its own 16-bit console ready to go. That system is the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or Super Famicom depending on your region. The Super NES represented a significant leap over the NES hardware before it. While its Ricoh CPU was less capable than the competition, the system made huge leaps with its picture processing unit and audio processing unit. And the system's biggest launch title? Super Mario World. Super Mario World applies many of the lessons learned in the creation of Super Mario Bros. 3, but it brings a whole new selection of impressive visual features to the table. On the surface, it doesn't appear to be pushing any real boundaries here, but what it does do is take advantage of the SNES hardware in a very tasteful way. With additional memory, levels could now contain more complex collections of tiles, enabling all sorts of new challenges within a single stage. An expanded color palette was also used to create richer worlds, while individual character sprites now featured many more frames of animation. Color averaging transparency was used liberally throughout as well, enabling all sorts of interesting effects. We also see color subtraction, which can be used to build atmosphere in certain levels, and it's used quite well here. Oh, and the game is filled with slopes of all different angles, a feature completely missing from Super Mario Maker, by the way, making it impossible to recreate this game using that engine. The Sony SPC700 audio chip enabled a much richer audio signature with all sorts of interesting samples here. Music was exceptionally high quality here, while the DSP capabilities of the system were put to use to create things such as echoes. 
parallax backgrounds of course were an important addition to any 16-bit title as well. Scaling and rotation even made an appearance at points in the game. It was an understated but beautifully designed game that plays as well today as it did 25 years ago. But there was another impressive launch title for the SNES that we just couldn't ignore here, and that game is F-Zero. A fantastic futuristic racing game which utilized the system's Mode 7 capabilities to create the illusion of a true three-dimensional racetrack. Mode 7 backgrounds are 256 color tile maps that can be rotated and scaled in real time. The SNES performs this affine transformation operation during the horizontal blank, the moment between when the CRT beam reaches the right side of the image and when it moves one line down and back to the left. There's just enough time here to perform an operation. This background layer then is basically rotated and moved around your vehicle, giving the impression that you are actually driving around on this surface. These two games really helped demonstrate just what the Super NES was capable of out of the gate. Rich colors, interesting new effects, advanced audio capabilities, and more. But it would be Nintendo's next generation platform where the real generation shift could be fully observed. The Nintendo Ultra 64 was teased and discussed for years prior to its arrival as the Nintendo 64. Arcade games such as Cruisin' USA gave us an idea of what we might see. But while the end result is very different from those arcade games, there's little doubt that Super Mario 64 perfectly demonstrates what the Nintendo 64 is all about. It was truly one of the most revolutionary games of all time, and it raised the bar for 3D visuals. When Mario 64 was released, 3D games were hardly new, but most attempts at a full 3D world just didn't feel quite right. Much of this was tied to controls and animation. By tying the full range of an analog stick to the movement of Mario, the game simply felt more natural and fun to play than other competing titles. You could vary movement from a slow jaunt to a full-on run just by tilting the analog stick. This was a far cry from the typical tank controls or digital movement of competing games. But we're most interested in the visuals. I believe that Mario 64 is still one of the finest looking games on the Nintendo 64 simply because it uses the hardware so effectively and efficiently. The Nintendo 64's limited 4K texture cache often presented issues when attempting more complex surfaces, but Mario 64 focuses more on simple colors rather than the high frequency patterns we saw in other games. Texture filtering was key in achieving this and was something uncommon on home machines at the time. 3D accelerator cards for the PC were just starting to take off, but most gamers were used to point sampled textures such as this. The Nintendo 64's texture filtering option enabled smooth interpolation of pixelated surfaces, and it worked brilliantly in Mario 64. The game also took advantage of the system's cartridge format to enable fast transitions between different areas, since the relevant data could be read directly from the cartridge memory rather than slowly loaded from a disc into work RAM. The N64 also supports perspective correct textures, unlike the competition, which could be used to its advantage here. On PlayStation, developers would often have to resort to heavily subdivided areas in which a high density of triangles were used to combat affine texture limitations. On Nintendo 64, developers could draw massive textured triangles without any distortion at all. You could create a gigantic box on the N64 using very few triangles, while on PlayStation you needed to devote a significant amount of resources to avoid severe warping issues. This enabled EAD to create much larger levels than we were used to seeing on PlayStation and Saturn using relatively little geometry. Mario 64 also features plenty of nice transparency effects and of course this cool mirror room which isn't an actual reflection since geometry is simply drawn on the opposite side, but it was convincing enough at the time. There's one more important element here, performance. Super Mario 64 operates at a steady 30 frames per second on real hardware. It's not perfect, mind you, but compared to most other platforms on the system that would follow, the frame rate here is very consistent. The clean visuals, stable performance, and excellent controls help Mario 64 stand the test of time and it's still a great game even today. There's another Nintendo 64 title we need to discuss, however. Wave Race 64. Okay, okay, so technically this is not a launch title, so I'm kind of cheating here, but it was released in Japan just as the console was hitting North America, so maybe we can let it slide. It's a better choice than Pilot Wings, after all. 
I really just want to give the game its due, since, after all, at the time of release there was no other game attempting such an impressive simulation of water. The movement of the waves and the way riders played off those waves was unlike anything we had seen before. The beautiful environments and brilliant water really made an impact at the time. We also have to squeeze in a quick performance analysis here as well. Wave Race doesn't exactly set the world on fire with its frame rate, but again, it was pretty acceptable for the time when considering what was happening on screen. Of course, the Nintendo 64 would continue on for some years, but soon, rumors of Nintendo's next generation system, codenamed Dolphin, began to appear. Revealed at Space World 2000, the Nintendo GameCube is, in many ways, the single finest piece of console engineering Nintendo has ever released. Let me introduce you to our new baby. It's a beautifully constructed, tightly packed machine with power to spare. It's so well made that it would wind up becoming the basis of multiple Nintendo consoles, in fact. And when it launched in the US, it was released with more launch titles than any other Nintendo system before it. Here are some of the standouts. First and foremost, there's Luigi's Mansion. Okay, so people were initially disappointed by the lack of a true Mario game here, especially on the tale of Mario 128 demo. But Luigi's Mansion demonstrated the capabilities of the system in its own unique way. Until Luigi's Mansion, Nintendo's games typically focused on bright, simple colors and shapes. But with this new game, the development team went down the path of light and shadow. Right from the start, we see shadows cast by flashes of lightning as well as shadows cast by the flashlight itself. This was really new and impressive at the time, and something we had not seen often. Luigi's Mansion also introduces the highest quality character models in a Nintendo game to date. Luigi's model was a massive step up from what we had seen on the Nintendo 64, and there was a perception that Nintendo was getting closer to matching its pre-rendered artwork here. Oh, and in the foyer here, there is actually a working mirror that we'll see throughout the game, and it's a real-time reflection. Very cool. The transparency used for ghosts is also excellent, giving them an ethereal appearance that's quite nice. Oh, and you know what, while we're here, I guess it wouldn't hurt to do a little frame rate analysis, would it? As we see here in the video, Luigi's Mansion runs at a completely locked 30 frames per second. It works just fine for this game, and it never hiccups. The only complaint I could level with the game is really the reliance on per-vertex lighting from the flashlight. It's not a huge deal, mind you, due to the ample triangle count in the game, but a per-pixel light using the system's more advanced features would have been pretty neat here. Speaking of those advanced features, there was another launch game which absolutely did take advantage of them. That game was Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader by Factor 5. Now this is a technical tour de force. At the time, on a CRT television, the game presented visuals that felt shockingly film-like. Incredibly detailed vehicles, impressive worlds, high-quality texture effects, all at a blistering 60 frames per second. This might just be one of the most technically ambitious launch titles of all time. Road Leader featured an incredibly high triangle count for its day. The various craft you could fly in the game were all represented in an unprecedented level of quality. The worlds you flew across were obscenely detailed, and every sequence was filled with ambient laser blasts and action all around. It really felt like you were in a Star Wars film. This was further enhanced by full self-shadowing on objects, and cloud shadows across the environments in certain areas. Textures were also top-notch throughout. Rogue Leader is able to take advantage of high-quality bump mapping, which reacts realistically to dynamic lights throughout the world. The texture environment pipeline is also put to good use here and is able to combine up to 8 texture layers in 16 stages in just one pass. All of this is under programmer control and it's possible to write complex shader code to produce impressive visual effects, such as the volumetric fog in certain stages and the targeting computer overlay for the game. All of this happens at 40p 60 frames per second. This was a very different time indeed. Many of the best looking games on the market also managed to run at a very high frame rate. It was really quite an eye opening experience seeing a game like this running at 60 frames per second at launch. That being said, in some of the busier scenes with lots of explosions, we do actually see some drops in performance. But overall, the game does run quite well. Factor 5, we miss your technical prowess. 
There were of course plenty of other nice looking GameCube games available at launch, but those last two games are definitely my favorite from a visual perspective. So what's next then? The move that surprised everyone. The Nintendo Revolution. This was the big shift when Nintendo's consoles moved from cutting edge technology to focusing on different ideas entirely. They called it the Wii. And people laughed, at least until it broke sales records month after month. It was a big deal, no doubt, and no game at launch demonstrated this better than the pack-in game, Wii Sports. Say what you want about Wii Sports, it was just a simple pack-in game with very basic visuals. It certainly wasn't pushing graphics technology forward. What it did do, however, was pave the way for a new type of experience, with motion controls. Now in many games, these controls never felt quite right. The way Nintendo implemented the capabilities of the Wii mode in this game, however, cannot be ignored. It simply felt that good to hit the tennis ball. Now, you'll find these capabilities in just about everything these days, and technology has evolved greatly with modern controls such as the HTC Vive Wands or the Oculus Touch, or even the gyroscopes in your phones. But it all started with Nintendo taking that leap back in 2006. Now, there were plenty of other games available for Wii at launch, including the latest Zelda title at the time, Twilight Princess. But it was Wii Sports that really defined the system. Hats off to Nintendo and the development team behind Wii Sports. They truly made history. Okay, so the next console is the Wii U, but that's not exactly retro yet and didn't really feature any truly standout launch titles aside from perhaps Zombie U. That said, the Wii U has become one of my favorite Nintendo systems of all time though. It just took a while to get going. And with that, we're out of time. I think that covers most of the major games that have launched on Nintendo's consoles over the year, right? But we're going to see it again, very shortly. In 2017, the Nintendo NX is launching. We know it's somewhere in the March time frame, and now we have a better idea of what the console is going to be with its hybrid console slash handheld approach. Now, we also know it's going to be launching with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, right? Which is a big deal. But what else is in store? That's what we really want to know, and that's what's still to come, of course, when Nintendo finally reveals the system to the public. So keep an eye out, and maybe we'll see history repeat itself once again with a brand new revolutionary game on Nintendo's next console. Now, we didn't get to touch on any of their actual handhelds this time, because then the episode would have gone on forever. But maybe in a future episode, we'll take a look back at the original Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Advance, and so on, and see what really made those systems tick right out of the gate. But for now, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. And until next time, stay retro. On the next episode of DF Retro, been rather busy in your absence, Mr. Freeman.